Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the ballots went out. The voting began here in California. Our first guest went from virtual no-name to one of the most influential figures in American politics in a very short time. He has a no new book out this week called Trust about restoring confidence in institutions, leaders, and more. He just wrapped up playing Vice President Mike Pence during debate preparations with California Senator Kamala Harris for the big VP debate. Mayor Pete Buttigieg, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good to see you. Same here. Thanks for having me back. All right, so you played Mike Pence behind the scenes. What was it like living inside the head of the Vice President? Well, it's uh, always strange spending that much time getting into the mind of, of someone you disagree with that much. But uh, I, I thought it uh, was an al also an opportunity as somebody who, you know, worked uh, with him uh, during the time, or sometimes against him, uh, during the time that I was mayor and he was governor. Uh, I know him well. I know what to expect from him. And I was glad that I could uh, uh, bring that to the team that was uh, helping Senator Harris get ready. And, uh, you know, she did a phenomenal job. And, uh, I would, you know, carrying really the weight of history onto that debate stage. I was uh, uh, really proud of, of uh, how she, uh, as uh, someone who is, you know, uh, such a, a significant leader in our time and, and uh, bringing so much to the ticket, I, I just, uh, I was thrilled that she was able to uh, get there and, and penetrate the sort of force field of alternate reality that he likes to create. <laughs> well, speaking of that, the president described Senator Harris as a monster, as a communist. What's your reaction to some of the reaction to her? Well, you know, it's uh, uh, unfortunately what we've come to expect from this president, but it also doesn't add up. I mean, you have somebody who uh, was, uh, you know, throughout her, her career um, and uh, certainly throughout this campaign, you know, demonstrating an approach that most Americans agree with. I mean, look, the, the Biden-Harris platform on issues from making sure the wealthy pay their fair share in taxes to making sure how everybody can get health care uh, to having a better way to deal with this pandemic. It's where most people already are. And, and that was the, the uh, disadvantage that Mike Pence had, as smooth of a debater as he is. When he walked onto that stage, he did so disagreeing with the American people on issue after issue. And in particular, the American people know that we deserve better than we've had in this administration's failed response to the pandemic. You know, there, there is one question um, that the Harris team, the Biden team, are just not answering, which is over um, whether or not to add a Supreme Court justice if the Democrats control the Senate. Why the political calculus not to answer that question? And what do you say to critics who say, you know what, voters deserve to know something like that. It's a pretty important issue. Well, I think what's going on here is they're trying to make sure that uh, the Republicans are not successful in distracting from the issue in front of us right now. There are all kinds of complex institutional issues facing the court. Uh, I've taken an interest in them in a long time. But what's going on right now is in a matter of days, the Senate could act to install a justice to a lifetime appointment who a few weeks from now uh, could be part of a majority that would eliminate pre-existing condition coverage and other vital elements of the Affordable Care Act uh, for all Americans. Uh, we are within weeks potentially of having a, a, a majority on the court willing to overturn marriage equality, uh, at least if the smoke signals from Justice Thomas and Alito uh, tell us anything. Well, because those issues are so important, there are a lot of folks on the left. I mean, in the last couple of weeks on our show, we've interviewed two former senators, Barbara Boxer and Al Franken, who both said that Democrats should strongly consider adding justices to the court because those issues are so important. What do you say? I mean, I'm more interested in, re in reforms that would just reduce the overall politicization of the court. We, we can't go on like this where there's a, an ideological death match every time there's a, a vacancy on the bench. There are a lot of ways to, to do that. I, I discussed many of them in my campaign. My views haven't changed, speaking only for myself. But again, uh, I think we need to make sure that uh, we don't allow some uh, uh, agenda to succeed distracting us from the very real, immediate, personal consequences of health care being stripped away from uh, millions of Americans by a decision that could be made this November. Speaking of distractions, I, 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 one more question about the debate. I know you prepare for everything, but was there a plan during debate prep for a fly landing on the VP's head for two minutes? <laughs> what did you make of that and all the memes that have come from it? 
You know, I was one of the last Americans to find out about the fly because we were in the hall and uh, you couldn't see it from where I was sitting. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I hope the fly's okay. Uh, I don't know if the fly was was stuck or if the fly was trying to warn us about something, uh, but it, it shows you the, the uh, way things work now, that, that it got a lot of attention. And I, I saw some rankings that uh, had uh, uh, the, the winner of the debate uh, as, as Senator Harris, followed by the fly with the, uh, the vice president in third place. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about some others. You've been really busy these days. You're hosting uh, the Deciding Decade podcast, which is really great. You're a great broadcaster. Congratulations on that. And you got a new book as well. Here is that book cover again. It is called Trust. And, and your main thesis of the book is every aspect of our society is really having a deficit of trust right now. We saw some of that expressed in a really visceral way during some of this year's civil unrest that we saw in streets here in California and, and all across the country. Um, how do we deal with that? Well, if you think about the biggest issues facing our country, from racial justice to this pandemic to uh, climate change, these are all issues that are going to require cooperation in order to advance, and it's just not going to happen unless we have greater trust. And that means building institutions that are more trustworthy. Uh, look, there are reasons why political trust and social trust have been falling swiftly in America in recent years, and we've got to do something about that. It's why I believe we need lots of institutional reforms to make our society more democratic. Uh, also, more attention to the reasons that this distrust has arisen, especially in the case of racial injustice, where, uh, you know, uh, many Americans, especially black Americans, have every reason to be skeptical and suspicious uh, of uh, institutions from uh, the, the criminal legal system uh, to medicine to banks. I mean, to me, part of the reason we don't have trust right now is, is we, we have also a truth crisis in the country. You, you see this in the presidential race. People living in information echo chambers aren't willing to accept facts that don't fit their particular narratives, sort of do this, don't want to listen to anybody else. How do we get out of that situation? Well, I think a lot of that comes down to our relationship with the media. Uh, the reality is that we're always going to have different interests and different values, but the only way we can have an honest negotiation of those interests and values is if we have the same facts. Now, ironically, the more raw information has become available to us through things like uh, digital media, the more we need journalists to help us sort fact from fiction, fiction and uh, to be transparent about when we're hearing an opinion and when we're hearing uh, uh, straight fact or, or, or coverage. And it's not just up to the media. Frankly, we as, as uh, citizens, as consumers of media, need to get a little more savvy uh, about uh, digital information the same way over time uh, humans learn to be a, a little smarter about what comes to us in print media and, as the saying goes, not believe everything we read. And, and on that theme of uh, sort of not listening to each other, in the spirit of trust, in the spirit of honesty, um, a lot of folks think that you're going to be a potential cabinet pick in the Biden administration. Which cabinet post do you want the most? <laughs> It, uh, I'm not going to get out of my head. I see what you're trying to do there, but uh, we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. Look, uh, the most important thing I can do right now is make sure there actually is a Biden-Harris administration. And then once there is, I'll do everything I can to support it. And if that means a chance to return to public service and support from within, that's great. And uh, if I'll be doing it from the outside, uh, that works too. I just want to make sure that we have a Biden-Harris administration to lead us out of this mess to restore the soul of the nation, as Joe Biden likes to say. Uh, and then I'll do everything I can to help one way or the other. Okay, can't, can't blame a brother for trying. All right, we also want to have a little bit of fun. Uh, <laughs> up next, we talk to the mayor about some more personal issues, including his husband, Chastin. And why is Chastin not a fan of Star Trek? <laughs> that and more when we come back. We also want to have a little bit of fun. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, stroll down memory lane a bit. Please welcome Pete Buttigieg. The last time we talked to Mayor Pete Buttigieg, we were at USC in front of nearly 2,000 students. Now we're talking via Skype. He's in his kitchen. <laughs> this event here feels like a million years ago. It was in February. Uh, we, we had a lighter moment then when we were talking, when we asked who should play you in a movie, and Jimmy Fallon, Hap apparently he's a big fan of the issue is, happened to be watching our show. Take a look. Who would play you in a biopic? I'm hoping for John Mulaney. Oh, okay. I could see that. <laughs> I was like, yo! I mean... 
Would you I'm ever? hoping for it. Like, I've been offered two movies, and I am in both of them. And <laughs> <laughs> so he's in, right? Pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Sounds like a deal. Yeah. yeah. Fun <laughs> question. Here's a fun question. To actually do it. Yeah. Here's a fun question from producer Nick Greitzer. If John Mulaney plays you in the movie, who plays your husband, Chaston, in the movie? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to have to ask him so I don't get the wrong answer and get in trouble. <laughs> Uh, but that would probably be the more interesting part to play. Yeah. All right. Speaking of Chaston, you're, you're famously a huge Star Trek The Next Generation fan, as am I. You even got to interview Captain Picard himself, Patrick Stewart, while you were guest hosting Jimmy Kimmel yeah. Live, which I was so jealous of. So we recently had Chaston on our show, and I think he was sitting in that same exact spot. A and I was shocked at his oh. answer to this question. Star Trek or Star Wars? Neither. Star Trek or Star Wars? Neither? That's <laughs> her answer. <laughs> well, because I saw it. So I was watching Harry Potter movies. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was never. Sorry. <laughs> How do you marry somebody I, I like that? As a <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I haven't given up. I, 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 got him, I got him fairly interested in the new Picard series. So we're, we're, we're making tracks. But uh, clearly, I've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, well, well, when you were in Kimmel, you showed yourself dressed as Captain Picard for Halloween at a very young age. And I think I dressed in the oh. very same costume at the very same time. Here, here's a picture of that. Wow. <laughs> so, I'll just say, some would say that hey, we're dorks. Take a look. Yeah, some would say we're dorks. I say we have great taste. <laughs> Let's go with that. Absolutely. Uh, something else that was, that was, I think, really touching and really moving when, when we talked with Chaston recently. Uh, we, we talked to him uh, about his book. Congratulations to him on that. And what you mean to him. Here, here's what he said. The thing I love about Pete is he made me feel so seen uh, and so loved um, and comfortable being myself. I mean, he took a wrecking ball to that wall I built up between my heart and the rest of the world. And to f feel truly loved like that, to feel understood and, and cherished for who you are, that is the greatest gift of all. So, I mean, he means the world to me. What's your reaction to that? And, and what does he mean to you? Uh, well, he, he means the world to me. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I, I know I'm, I'm a better person because he's in my life. When, when I say that he's the best thing that, that happened to me, that that's uh, uh, morally as well as in a lot of other ways. Uh, he, he helps me see things I would never see otherwise. And uh, um, uh, I just uh, I don't know. I don't know what I did to, to be lucky enough to, to have him in my life. But he's the best. And, and to bring things full circle, in the book Trust, it's dedicated for Chaston, whose trust changed my life. Uh, congratulations on the book. Congratulations on the podcast. Congratulations on the marriage. <laughs> congratulations on everything. Thank you for being here. You know we also are a big fan of music on this show. So this week, as we go out, uh, we chose as a musical artist, you. Here's some of you playing. Literally the piano man. Uh, talk to us about your your love of music and what music does for you. Oh yeah, you know, music is is where I go to maybe not think or at least not be uh, uh, processing things the way I, I do kind of the rest of the time. There's there's something about just that that simple beauty of, of sound and, uh, and that kind of art that takes me to a different place. And when I'm at the piano or I got a guitar in my hands, I uh, uh, just uh, uh, I don't know. Everything else starts to wash away and resolve. Uh, it's also been a great way to connect with people that I just never would have got to know otherwise. So I'm, I'm taking advantage. Chasman got us a, a, a guitar um, uh, and uh, uh, taking advantage of having a, a little bit more, I won't say there's a lot more free time, but we're not moving around quite as much. And uh, that lets me play just a bit more, which I love. All right. Thank you, Mayor. We go out with your music, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. More of the issue is after this. when you were at France continues to be a school. You're going to have to take that off, please. Just, you can take oh. it off. Can you take it off because I cannot hear I'll, you? I'll just speak louder, sir. Oh, okay, because you want to be politically correct. Go ahead. No, sir. That was Jeff Mason, White House correspondent for Reuters with the exchanges with President Trump over masks. This week, after President Trump returned from the hospital, he ripped off his mask, even though he still had COVID-19. Jeff Mason joins us via Skype now from Washington. And one of the advantages of uh, doing this from home is you don't have to wear a mask and we get to see the great artwork behind you. 
<laughs> Jeff, welcome back to the issue. Thank you. <laughs> Good to be with you, Alex. All right. So, so um, there were some that thought maybe if the president gets coronavirus and goes to the hospital, his feeling about it, his feeling about masks, his feeling about restrictions or regulations might change. But in reality, it seems like he's doubling down to the way that he thought before it, trying to still sort of downplay COVID-19, scheduling more rallies, um, taking off his mask. What's the political calculus in his mind when it comes to that? I think uh, Donald Trump is somebody who doesn't like to move away from a position that he has already articulated and his, his position on masking uh, has been pretty clear from the beginning. Even though he says he supports it, he very rarely wears one himself. And as you mentioned, when he got back from the hospital, he ripped that off, uh, ripped it off. And that, that was a, a, I think, a symbolic gesture uh, that epitomizes his, his view largely about the virus and about the, the guidance about how to prevent the virus from spreading. You know, I first met you um, when the president came to California. I was part of the White House press pool for, for a day. And I was uh, surprised um, that they required all of the reporters to wear masks. That was the White House press team that asked that. But most of the folks around were not wearing masks, including Hope Hicks, who ended up getting COVID-19. Have the rules changed? Have the protocols changed? And, and can you take us a little bit behind the scenes of what's it like working at the White House in the midst of so many folks there getting infected? Sure. Well, it's interesting to me that they told you that you needed to wear a mask then because the, the rules that we've been following in the White House press corps have not been rules dictated by the White House. They've been really good guys from the CDC and from the White House Correspondents Association, which is the group of reporters uh, at the White House. So we've been wearing masks. Reporters at the White House have been wearing masks for months. Uh, White House officials have not. And you know, it's it's just that that became very clear in the last week when an outbreak within the White House really, really took off. In terms of being sort of behind the scenes, Alex, I can tell you that, that there has been a change uh, in the last week being inside the White House. Number one, there are fewer people there. It's almost like a ghost town because so many people were exposed and have been affected by this outbreak. But number two, the people who are coming to work uh, in person at the White House, in addition to the reporters like myself, have started wearing masks inside their offices. And that was not the case uh, before this outbreak and before the president got COVID himself. You've also been out on the road covering Joe Biden. Talk to us about some of the biggest differences between those two experiences and what it's like going to a Joe Biden event compared to going to a President Trump event. I was on his trip to Miami. I was on a trip to Michigan. And he wears a mask. In fact, when he was in Florida, he wore a mask throughout his speech, which is a shift even from uh, his previous speeches. That is a that was an adjustment, I think, after the president got the coronavirus. The events themselves are socially distant. Uh, there are far fewer people there. Covering President Trump during this campaign has been a little bit as if the pandemic weren't happening. You, you go to rallies, there are thousands and thousands of people where people just aren't socially distant and aren't wearing masks. Some people are, some people wear them, but it's definitely the exception and not the rule. Whereas with the Biden campaign, um, it, was, it was definitely the rule. You know, most polls seem to indicate that Joe Biden's got a, got a healthy lead right now um, in, in most swing states and a big lead nationally. Um, that, that means the Trump campaign really could use another debate to try to change the narrative. This week, the president says, I don't want to do a virtual debate. And then Joe Biden says, fine, I'll schedule something else. I got a town hall. I'm, I'm out. I mean, did the Biden campaign sort of call the bluff of the president there? And, and where do you see the future of debates going? The fact that President Trump decided he didn't want to participate in a virtual debate uh, in some ways was a gift to Vice President Biden, because as you said, he is now holding his own event. I suspect President Trump will hold his own event that night, too. But those events, whether it's a, a town hall or a rally, won't get the same eyeballs, the same viewers that a nationally televised debate would have. Uh, and right now, it's, it's the person who's behind, President Trump, who really needs those eyeballs. Yeah, I mean, a, a Trump rally could probably air on Fox News Channel, get maybe three or four million viewers. A debate in prime time between the two of them could get 60, 70, 80 million viewers. Uh, so 
big difference there when you're trying to reach out beyond your base as well, as you mentioned. Okay, so so much of uh, reporting is about the story, but we don't get to hear a lot about you. So we see you in the briefing room, but we want to get to know you a little bit better. So we play a game called Personal Issues on this show. This is where we, we put 30 seconds up on the clock and we, we get to know a little bit more about you. Okay, you ready? All right, I'm ready. Okay, what's your favorite meal to cook? Salmon. Uh, uh, any new skills you've learned during quarantine? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, apropos cooking, I'm cooking a little bit more. Uh, what is your favorite book? The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen. What's your favorite band? Guster. Um, what is your favorite show to binge? I'm going to have to go with Ozark. Good one. Love Netflix. And finally, who is your role model? My grandparents. Very nice. Why is that? Oh, I, I was really lucky growing up. I had all four grandparents for most of my life. And my, my grandmother on, my, on the maternal side is 103 and still living. Wow. Uh, it's, it's been pretty awesome. That is, that, they're very lucky on that front. All right, well, you said there that your favorite band is Guster. So I picked one of my favorite Guster songs for you. Here is Satellite, and this is where we get to see what a good dancer you are. I hear from the White House folks that you're like the best <laughs> dancer in the White House press corps. So maybe we'll see that, that jamming out. Let's play a little of uh, Satellite if we can. Uh, here's the, the music video. If you want a bit of a, a throwback, <laughs> to Jeff's college days at Northwestern. Here it is. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Jeff Mason. Thank you for the important work you do on the front lines of journalism as well. And that is a very impressive sway. I could see that. <laughs> Thanks. For Thanks. For More of the issue is right after this. Thanks, Alan. Next week on The Issue Is, legendary news anchor Katie Couric will be with us. Last week, uh, we talked about the fact that Republican Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy would be with us this week. Unfortunately, he had a last-minute scheduling conflict. We hope he'll be joining us again soon. Let's end this week with a tribute to one of the greatest guitar gods of all time. Thanks for watching The Issue Is, and rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen.